Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from sunny Miami, Florida. Today we have the pleasure of having Michael Weinstock, uh, MD. He's an emergency physician from Pennsylvania, and he's written a couple of books of which he's going to talk. And we're also graced by the presence of C. Cadet, a board-certified emergency physician originally well, she spent most of a lot of time in Wichita Falls, Texas. And first, we'll introduce uh, C, Dr. Cadet. How are you doing, Dr. Cadet? Hi. Good afternoon, John. Glad to be here. Looking forward to hearing from Dr. Weinstock this afternoon. Thank you yeah, for inviting me. Yeah, this is. I just mentioned the mic before we started. This is her first hangout, and hopefully, <laughs> she'll be running this channel of emergency medicine. So, good day, Michael. It's all yours. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's, it's an honor to be on with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to talk today about the Bounce Back series of books. And I'm going to start because we had a, um, when I first started actually working in emergency medicine at Mount Carmel St. Anne's, actually in Columbus, Ohio. And in addition to working there, I also am a adjunct professor of emergency medicine at the Ohio State University and do teaching there too. So all this together, what I found is that we needed within our hospital, it's a community hospital, but a busy community hospital, about 80,000 patients a year, we needed a way to do Q&A, so a way to make sure that we actually had the very best medical care that we could practice, but there's always a problem with medical education. And the problem is that to get people engaged to actually go to a conference is tough and people have families, they have other commitments, and so they don't always want to spend that time, their free time, going to conferences. So the very first one that we had was uh, me and these two guys in my living room. So it was not a very busy conference. But I think just almost by chance, what happened is that the cases that we looked at, and we did that in a, in a case-based format, were cases of patients who had come to the emergency department and gotten sent home, and then who would come back. And there are different terms for that. One of them is that they had bounced back. And we did this conference for 10 years. And it was a pretty successful conference eventually, growing and growing, till we had most of the people in our group would come at times that they weren't even, you know, except for the folks that were working, the people would be at the conference because they all wanted to hear not only about their own cases of patients who got sent home and then bounced back, but they also wanted to hear about other people's cases because there's this sort of vicarious pleasure that you sort of get. Maybe it's not even a pleasure. That might be the wrong word. But a vicarious sort of thrill that you get from being an armchair quarterback, you know, a Monday morning quarterback of someone else's cases. Because when a patient bounces back, it's usually not to tell the first physician, hey, you did such a great job. Here's a box of cookies, you know. <laughs> um, the worst bounce back, of course, is the patient who bounces back horizontally. They bounce back on a gurney with chest compressions occurring. And we actually have had cases of that, as, as everybody has. So just a little background about bounce backs is that about 3%, and there's different figures, but if you use a figure within 72 hours, 3% of people bounce back. So if you see 30 people on your shift, about one of those patients within three days will bounce back to the emergency department. Now. It's not always because something wrong was done in the first visit. Sometimes, for example, with a kidney stone, a ureteral stone, patients might have that stone, they might have pain that is able to be controlled 95% of the time, but still some patients will come back because of the pain. So just because they come back doesn't really mean that something wrong was done at that initial visit. However, there are patients, the next more serious level is patients who come back and then end up getting admitted and not saying that if you get admitted, definitely something's wrong, but certainly there's more of a concern. And the most serious type of bounce back is a patient who dies within a short time after they were in the emergency department. There was a study by a guy named David Clar, David Sklar. This is a emergency physician at University of New Mexico Health Sciences Library, Health Sciences Center, and they looked at almost 400,000 patients who came to the emergency department and were discharged and then bounced back within a week. So they looked at these patients over a period of 10 years, and they found of these patients, there were over 100 of them that bounced back and died in a way that was related to that initial visit. And then when they teased things out and looked at the charts, there's some subjective component to this, but they found that there were 58 of them 
that died in a way that was related to that initial visit. And 35, that they thought possibly a medical error contributed to the fact that that patient bounced back and had a bad outcome. So this is a pretty serious thing. And if you calculate the numbers out, you find that every emergency physician will send home 17 patients during the course of their careers who will die an avoidable death in the next seven days after their discharge from the emergency department. So in one sense, you think, hey, that's pretty good. We are 99.99% .99 correct. That's with all the patients that come to the emergency department. Patients that come in that can't give you a good history because they're inebriated or maybe because they have a mental status change because of the dementia or meningitis or a brain injury. Patients who have chronic disease that's progressed and they haven't seen a doctor. So when you think of the really sick patients that come to the emergency department, being 99.99% correct is awesome. On the other hand, if your neighbor was getting ready to retire tomorrow and they were on shift and you knew that they had sent home 17 patients during the course of their career, again, one every two years, who had died an avoidable death and they had been sued 17 times and lost 17 malpractice lawsuits, I'm guessing if you had chest pain, you would be hoping that would not be the physician who was on when you came in to be evaluated for your chest pain. So in light of all that, in light of this conference that we started, the reason that it became so engaging, I think with medical education, there's multiple components that are important. One is certainly the quality of the education, but in another way, the importance, the importance is to have medical education that's engaging and colorful in a way that makes people remember the lessons that you're teaching. So there's a lot of information within medical education, but one of the markers is if you think about a lecture that you heard a year ago, if you remember one thing from one lecture from one year ago, that was an awesome lecture. Because I have high expectations when I give lectures, I try to get patients to remember, or I try to get the physicians that are in the audience and the providers in the audience to remember two things within a year. So, you know, maybe it's not too high of expectation I have for myself, but the more colorful that you can be with that, the better. So in light of all that, what happened is after 10 years of doing these conferences at my hospital, we'd collected quite a few cases. And we thought, well, why not put that into some sort of book format so other physicians, other providers can learn from that. So we came up with this book. And this book got published, and it's called Bounce Backs. I'm not sure how easy it is to see with the glare there. That might be a little bit easier. But this book is a collection of 30 patients who presented to the emergency department who got sent home and then bounced back and had a bad outcome. Now, what we decided to do with the format of the book is we got Greg Henry. Greg Henry is an emergency physician. He is the past president of the American College of Emergency Physicians, and he's a medical legal expert. He has testified in more medical legal cases than anyone in the country. During the course of his career, he has been an expert witness on 2,000 medical legal cases involving emergency medicine. So we shortened the initial chart, but it's all the actual documentation. We put that information down, and then without knowing the eventual final diagnosis, Greg Henry made commentary on that initial visit. He had commentary on the medical evaluation and also on some of the risk management considerations as well as patient safety considerations. Then we presented the bounce back visit or sometimes visits. There was one patient I could talk about some of these specific cases as we go through things a little bit, but he presented or they went, we presented the bounce back visit or visits and then finally as a summary we had different national experts on all 30 of these cases write a commentary, a reference commentary on the initial, di initial symptoms on the final diagnosis and all of that within the context of the case got presented. So you can see we were able to find a format that rolled all these goals into one. We had a very strong medical message, but we did it in a way that was colorful that people could relate to. And our goal was for the reader to say, you know what? I have seen that same patient. I've seen that patient with the runny nose and the headache. I've seen that patient with the abdominal pain. I've seen a patient who was having chest pain and sweating but told me, you know what, doc, it's fine. The room was hot. I was sweaty because the room was hot. I'm short of breath because I have deconditioning. I wanted the reader to say I would have handled things in that way. 
And then I wanted them, as they went through the rest of the chapter, to realize some of the red flags that were out there with considerations for patient safety as ways that could have made patients safer. So let me talk about just a few of these cases because there are some really, really interesting cases and ones that patients can, and as uh, everyone really can, can learn from. So one of the cases, and I'll just go into this, um, some of these briefly, but this is a case of a, not a bounce back, but a bounce backs. He was like the, the mother of all bounce backs, a patient who came in with a headache. He was a man, he um, was ancestrally from Africa. He had headaches, and when he came in, he told the emergency physician, I've been having headaches for 20 years. And he also had some other symptoms. The emergency physician thought, well, you know, this headache, does not seem to be one of those bad life-threatening causes of headache. It's probably more of a muscle tension or migraine headache, which are the two most common benign types of headaches. The patient was prescribed pain medicine. The patient kept returning and returning and returning, and finally, this patient returned with continued headaches, and finally, a lumbar puncture was done, showing that the patient had an entity called cryptococcal meningitis, a fungal infection of the brain, which really is only present in patients who have some sort of immunosuppression. In other words, he had a suppression of his immune system because of undiagnosed AIDS. Well, interestingly, there were a couple learning points, very strong learning points with this case. And probably the strongest was the fact that no one asked the patient about weight loss. So you wouldn't really think that's an incredibly important point to ask a patient about weight loss, someone who has a headache. However, when that was asked towards the end of the number of visits that he had, this patient had between 20 and 30 pounds of unintentional weight loss. And if that had been known on the initial visit, some other types of historical as well as physical exam type of considerations would have gone into that provider's assessment. In other words, did the patient have what's called leukoplakia of their tongue, where you have those linear white lines, vertically oriented white lines that might go along with a patient who has undiagnosed AIDS or seborrheic dermatitis or lymph nodes swelling, lymphadenopathy, or any one of a number of history and physical exam findings that you could find with AIDS without even having to do any blood testing. So it's a great case that I wanted to bring up because what it does is it demonstrates the importance of the history and the physical exam. And the history and the physical is what we're really trying to get at with these books and with these cases is that if you do a better history and physical and you have a wider, more expanded differential diagnosis, well, I think that oftentimes, I mean, there's a joke in emergency medicine and probably just in medicine in general is, you know, have you ever seen a case of this, whatever it might happen to be, and you say, well, I've never diagnosed a case of it. So obviously the joke is that maybe you've seen that case but just haven't made the diagnosis. And if that's not in the consideration that you have as far as, well, you know, we're thinking this could possibly be a, for example, cryptococcal meningitis. If you're not thinking about it, you don't include it in your differential diagnosis, you'll obviously never make the diagnosis of it. So we have patients in this book of these 30 cases. Um, there was one of a five-month-old who had a chest x-ray. They were looking for pneumonia because of some shortness of breath. Turned out that the patient had multiple rib fractures. The patient got sent home and unfortunately came back with a mortality, a victim of child abuse. So again, including that in your differential and looking for those things specifically on a chest x-ray of an infant is important to do. We had a patient who came in with a headache and it turned out that with the neurologic symptoms, the physician was thinking, this was a 36-year-old, the neurologic symptoms, the, pa the, the physician was thinking, well, maybe it's a stroke. Well, in that age group, if you think of that type of presentation, more commonly, some other considerations weigh in there. This patient turned out to have a dissection of their carotid artery and went in to have a very poor neurologic outcome because of that. So we had these cases, and it was, I think, really interesting in the emergency medicine community. And to this date, we've sold almost 10,000 of these books around a lot of residencies, use that for their risk management and for their teaching purposes. And in addition to that, for myself, really working with these great physicians really made me a much better emergency physician because of that. And the question is, you know, where do we go from here with the books? Where do we go from here from the teaching? Just doing another 30 cases would have been good, but I thought, wow, you know, if we're really trying to hammer home a point, why not bring the legal into it? 
why not say, because every physician feels like, look, I'm in there doing my best, and these really these these lawyers are trying to get all the the money they can, and and they do, they get about 50% of money they they win, so the client, the plaintiff, really only gets 50%. But I thought, what better way is to bring some of the legal in there? That would really demonstrate the the point well. So in 2011, I came up with a second book, and this is Bounce Back's Medical Legal. And the interesting part about this book is that we designed this book to be similar to the TV show Law and Order. So this book is 10 cases, but it's like you go in for your shift, you see 10 patients with completely benign complaints, like I was shoulder pain, someone with some upper respiratory symptoms that might have been from asthma, a patient with abdominal pain with a non-concerning exam, a patient who had a passing out episode. You see 10 patients, you send them all home, but over the next couple months, you get 10 letters in the mail showing that these are all legal cases. And that is the way that we designed the book. The first half of each case is medical, and the sef second half is legal. You can sort of hear that law and order ba -bum, going when you're reading through the cases. And what we wanted to do with this one is very similar to what we did before, but to really, again, make that lesson stick even better. So now I'm shooting for three things to remember a year later, <laughs> not just two things. I'm really up in the ante on myself, the high expectations. Mm -hmm. So these cases, we also started off from the patient's perspective, so a patient's story. So for example, case one is a 39-year-old woman. She's a wife, she's a mother of three boys, and she is woken in the morning with some chest pain and shortness of breath, goes to the emergency department, and they do a lung exam, and she has wheezing. Well, she's a smoker. She tells the physician, every year at this time, I get bronchitis. And actually, six weeks before, she'd been in to see her primary care physician and was diagnosed with the same thing with bronchitis. Interestingly, prescribed an antibiotic, even though bronchitis is usually viral, but that happens very frequently. So she got prescribed a Z pack of some antibiotics for that. She has the same diagnosis, really, at the emergency department and is sent home with another z -pack, and she had had a breathing treatment, she had a chest x-ray that came back fine. The problem is, is that she was home for most of the day and around dinner time she went into the kitchen and her husband hears the water glass drop to the floor and crack and goes in and finds her unresponsive. He calls 911 and when they get there the husband says, well she was choking on food and that's why she passed out and is having this. They did CPR. They found that she was what's called asystolic when you're basically flat, flatlined. And they, unfortunately, despite the efforts they did at the home and at the emergency department, were unable to resuscitate this 39-year-old woman. So the question is, what happened? What happened with this patient? Well, as it turns out, women can have very atypical or unusual types of presentations of their acute coronary syndrome of, or of their heart attacks. And when they did the autopsy, they found that she had not only a new acute heart attack, but also evidence that she'd had a heart attack six weeks previously when she was at her primary care physician and being diagnosed with bronchitis. So we actually went to the next level and used some data from a guy named Pat Crosscarry, is a Canadian emergency physician, who looked at all these, what he termed, cognitive dispositions to respond these CDRs, ways that physicians can get tricked. One of them is something called diagnosis momentum, where a physician, because of a previous diagnosis, gets trapped into this current diagnosis. And the patient came in, patient came in and tells the physician, I've got acute bronchitis. Physician says, you're coughing, you have some wheezing, you're a smoker, I'm sure you do. But if you look at the chart, there were certain things that weren't really addressed the fact that the patient had this chest pain and back pain. They didn't ask if the pain was exertional, which is really you'd think when you're thinking about chest pain and possibility of heart type of symptoms, almost like the first question you'd ask. And at the risk of being indelicate, the patient had had relations with her husband the night before and with that exertion had had chest pain. But that never came out because that question wasn't asked. So we went through and looked at all those different risk management of patient safety considerations with this patient and then presented this bounce back visit. 
and then presented the trial testimony and then had different commentary by not only an attorney but also by a medical expert on evaluation of patients with chest pain. So that's just one chapter in the book but it goes through a fairly avoidable death. This patient didn't get an EKG despite the fact that if they would have asked some further questions they'd have found she had not only chest pain but shortness of breath, her chest pain was exertional, she had a very strong family history with several siblings that had died and there's a little controversy with how strong the risk factors are related to things in the emergency department and the emergency evaluation of chest pain but there were a lot of questions that weren't asked because again this diagnosis was not in the consideration. There was a very short progress note, almost non-existent progress note and in the end this went to jury and um, my website embouncebacks.com, so like emergency medicine, embouncebacks.com has a lot of that trial testimony. It's a free website. You can click on it and read that trial testimony. It's a really unusual and, and difficult thing to try to find that trial testimony, but it's on there. So this went all the way through and they had a vote of the jury actually settled, uh, decided in favor of the physician, which actually happens about 85% of the time. So this case did go to that point. Greg Henry, who is one of these co-authors, has said many times that in a jury trial there are there's, there's never a winner. You have one loser and you have another loser who's a bigger loser. So unfortunately taking the average amount of time, which is 45 months, to go through a trial, man, there is no winning from that with the different stress and anxiety that goes through a physician as well as of course this bad outcome that happened to the patient. But we talk about a lot of different things that are seemingly benign. A 15 year old with a headache who actually presented on 9-11 of 2001, a fighter man with a shoulder pain, a patient who had a passing out episode as I discussed earlier, a patient who had some dizziness and numbness all over who was fine by the time he got to the emergency department and again this book is sort of designed like you would have seen all these patients in one shift. So I'll briefly talk about the last book because it has again just a little bit of a different type of format and then we can sort of have some further discussion on that. But this book is called Bounce Back Pediatrics and um, we get the B in there. So this book here is a collection of 28 cases of all pediatric cases and we thought well what's the next place to go from here because if you work in a children's emergency department, obviously that's what you see all day is children. However, if you work in an adult emergency department and you're not in a, you know, pediatric center of excellence or maybe you're in a city where they have a children's emergency department so you don't see that many kids, just like anything, the more things and the more times that you see things, the better you get at those type of evaluations. Well, we decided to put this book out there but the little different twist that we did, the colorful aspect of this book, is that we had all of these cases, the authors, they had actually seen these patients on either the first or the second visit. So these stories are real, they're emotional, and they really hit close to home. In fact, we have some of the discussions where the physician said, I sent this patient home, I remember them very well, and I'm finishing my shift, and I see them coming back in, being rushed back to room on a stretcher. And I said, wow, I recognize that kid, I recognize those parents. So that's not, again, saying that something necessarily was wrong on that first visit or done incorrectly, but it's that if we can expand our differential, and especially with the pediatric book, to look at things in an age-specific distribution, we can be better providers. We can have a much better ability to care for our patients. So I'll close out the discussion by um, just talking about one of these cases from the pediatric bounce backs book and actually it's a case that I learned about I was giving a lecture at the all LA emergency conference this is a collection of different residency in Los Angeles and I was giving a lecture and after the lecture Marianne Gauche who's a famous researcher in emergency medicine and pediatric emergency medicine came up to me and she told me about a case and I thought to myself at the time you know what it seems like everything was well done on this case it doesn't seem like there's any teaching value because if it's so obvious or so esoteric, there really isn't any teaching value to say, well, don't give 10 times the normal dose of insulin. They're like, well, how am I learning anything from that? Or I saw something that was a one in a million presentation. Well, again, that's not the lesson that I want to give. You should be testing for these one in a million things because sometimes tests can actually make patients worse if you do over testing. But as I thought about it more, 
It was a case of a five-year-old boy. He had a headache, and he came in with a, um, a headache and complaint of a fever. It was a 10-year-old boy with a fever and a headache, and he had an evaluation, and he, had, he said he had just been exposed uh, to a friend of his who had meningitis. They didn't really have any more information than that. And the emergency provider, and you'll see what I was talking about, how it seems so esoteric at the time when I first heard about it, but the emergency provider took this patient seriously. They did, took it so seriously, they did a lumbar puncture on the child, which came back negative. Patient got sent home. He came back less than 24 hours, bounced back to the emergency department, unfortunately expired. This 10-year-old died, and what he had was he had meningococcemia. So he didn't have meningococcal meningitis because, again, his lumbar puncture, his spinal tap was negative. He had diffuse sepsis from this meningococcemia, which is a horrible bacteria that can kill people fast. I mean, I've seen people in my emergency department walk in, and within a couple hours, that patient is being coded. I mean, that's how fast this type of bacteria can, can affect a patient. But the lessons from that case with a 10-year-old who died are really profound. One is they didn't obtain the adequate amount of history. They said, well, we don't really know about this, meningi this meningitis exposure. Well, why not call the hospital where that patient is? Why not call their parents and have them call the hospital? If they would have found that they really had a friend who was in the ICU with meningitis, that would have totally changed, maybe even resulted in some prophylaxis or even admission for this patient or a consideration of meningococcemia. And this is one of the really important points of all these bounce back books is making sure that our history and physical are really well done. They take into consideration the potential life-threatening problems and they subscribe to the mantra that I'm sure Dr. Cadet and I know well in emergency medicine, think worst first. That's what we do in emergency medicine. And I think these books hopefully take us a little bit further along that path to make sure that we're thinking about some of the bad things that can harm patients. Uh, very good, Michael. Uh, you, you take me back to the days when I used to work in the emergency room. You know, <laughs> cer certainly it's, it's, it's a tricky place to work, and I, I'm sure you and Dr. Cadet will agree on that. Uh, not only do you have to come, you know, it's one part of the hospital where you have to come to a diagnosis, or ten, at least a tentative diagnosis, to follow up, as well as having pressure from administration to move those patients, yes. move them, move them quickly. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen that, especially if you work in one as busy as you are. Yes. And those, those are also factors. Uh, but uh, you certainly, you know, open the. Uh, the discussion up to a lot of areas. And Dr. Cadet, you want to start off? Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Weinstein. That was an excellent presentation. Sure. Um, the question that comes to mind when I think about your presentation of the cases, um, in your research and, and in preparing your books, what would you say are some of the patient risk factors and red flags most associated with ED bounce back? Well, one of the biggest ones, we talked about that diagnosis momentum where the patient has a previous diagnosis that becomes established and you don't think out of the box and think further than that. But there are a lot of different things. In fact, emergency medicine, the practice of emergency medicine as compared to being an airline pilot, and they do a checklist. They use a checklist approach, and that works, and that's a good thing, and we do that with certain types of medical conditions. For example, consideration of giving TPA to dissolve a blood clot with an acute stroke. However, there's a lot of things that airline pilots don't have to deal with because they have a plane that has instruments that presumably give accurate information. We oftentimes are dealing with patients who are sick, who aren't able to give any verbal history, patients who might not share all of the information that we need to know about because they're embarrassed that they have some sort of disease or AIDS or Maybe they have some sort of symptom that they don't want us to know about specifically because it is embarrassing. And there's also patients who come in and who, because of, again, a medical problem, have a problem with addiction to some type of medicine, maybe opiate type of medicine, and are trying to tell us a different story to get 
medications from us, a prescription for some Percocet or different type of opiate medications. So I think one of the biggest things that is a fallback is not realizing that those type of errors might be occurring. So Crosscarry talked about this thing called, he said, um, not only these CDRs are important to know about, but he talked about a concept called metacognition. And it's the, really the highest level of thinking, and it doesn't have to go just in medicine, but in all types of thinking, when we monitor our own thought-making process. So we monitor that so we know when our thought-making process might be prone to error. And if we have that consideration by saying, hey, yeah, you know, I read about this case, and this is something that still could be going on, even though the patient has other symptoms. Well, going back and then doing a further history and exam, a lot of times will go away, far away, I think, towards making a patient safer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, do you think there are certain groups of patients, like, for instance, the patients that leave AMA or the ones that, um, you know, don't have a primary care doctor, certain groups that are more prone to coming back a, well, that AMA is always a risky time yeah. because the patient we've already decided needs to be admitted, so we've already decided they're pretty sick. There are that group of patients that are are sick, and one thing within Sklar's study is he found that of all the patients that got sent home, those 35 patients where they thought a medical error occurred, where they got sent home and died an avoidable death within one week, he found surprisingly 71% of those patients were sent home with unexplained tachycardia and a full 85% had abnormal vital signs on their emergency department discharge. So that's the simplest way to find these types of patients, that low-hanging fruit. You know, if the patient is tachycardic or based on their symptoms, a potentially life-threatening or ending complaint, with some diagnostic uncertainty, any, uh, if either of those two things are occurring, I think those are the patients we need to do what I say three things, the three R's. We need to revisit, in other words, go back and see that patient again to see if their disease has progressed. We need to record to make a progress note and medical decision making note in the chart. And we need to recruit. Why not use all of the resources that we have available to help out as far as that follow up and say to the family, if this patient gets worse, come back. Say to the patient, if you get worse, put that on their discharge instructions. So, yeah, I think that one of the biggest things that we need to look at for is patient with unexplained tachycardia on discharge. Mm -hmm. Right, I agree. What, what are the most, uh, most of the, the, or the riskiest uh, complaints that patients have? I imagine chest, chest pain and headache are probably up there. What, what's right. your, which are the complaints that automatically put your ears up and, and have your radar come out? So chest pain is certainly one, abdominal pain, fever and headache, and especially in combination, and even just headache by itself. But one of the things that can fool us the easiest is are some of the neurologic complaints, the headache and numbness type of complaints that can happen because you can get numbness from hyperventilation or from a panic attack, but you can also get numbness from you know, a stroke, a carotid or some sort of neck artery dissection, from multiple sclerosis, from any one of a number of pretty serious problems. So um, if you think about some of those bad complaints, and those are some of the things that I talk about, you know, when you have a potential life-ending complaint like chest pain, abdominal pain, headache, numbness, these types of things, with some amount of diagnostic uncertainty, so you say, you know, even after my evaluation, I still don't know what's going on with this patient. That's when I advocate using that 3R approach. Okay. Uh, do you ever have patients just like stay in the emergency room and wait till you figure out what's going on? Uh, are you, uh, at your hospital, are you allowed to do that? To like I have a holding area until you can... Well, we don't have anything? a observation unit. We used to have okay. one and we found it wasn't as helpful as we had hoped that it would be. Okay. But, you know, patients that are in our emergency department, I would ra way rather, and, and, and as all hospitals now, we are trying to get away from long ER waits. We want to have what's called throughput, where we get a patient through very quickly and, you know, either from the emergency physician's perspective, like the treat them and street them type of perspective or from administration. They want decreased length of stay times for not only discharged patients but also admitted patients. That helps with patient satisfaction and helps with keeping the hospital rolling in a predictable manner and not getting a backlog anywhere. But I would way rather have a patient wait in the emergency department longer 
possibly to see if their disease progresses or for some other reason than to have us send someone home that would have a bad outcome. And I would say that in our patients, if we do have, after our emergency department evaluation is completed, concern for potential lifetime and complaint, well, that patient would then just be admitted. And they might be admitted under an observation capacity, 23-hour OBS, but, you know, if we think that something bad is going with that patient, they really cannot go home just by themselves. And if even if, and if they do, you'd certainly want to have an action and time specific plan for for discharge, and what they would do, when they would need to return, and when they're going to follow up with the primary care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you're familiar with what's called the frequent flyer. The patients yes. That you see <laughs> over and over again, and um, I'm wondering, first of all. In any of the books, do you have a case where it's a frequent flyer and everybody's just like, oh, it's him again, and, and then it turns out to be a serious <laughs> bounce back, <laughs> unfortunately? Right. But, um, well, we, we do. I was going to try to show you a uh, picture of one of our frequent flyer patients here. It's a, um, uh, <laughs> it's a patient who comes in, and we all have these things because we see them so commonly that we can let our guard down. So it's sort of like a airline you know, screener like the TSA, they see these people so frequently. This is, again, I'm not sure how well this is going to come out on the video here, but this is the <laughs> character of the frequent flyer here, lady who comes in with a headache and she's wearing dark sunglasses, but she's also eating a popsicle. Well, right. you know, <laughs> that is definitely one that we would be letting our guard down about. But right. with those frequent flyer patients, or the other one that I know you know well too is the multiple complaint patient who right. has a headache, and they have chest pain, and abdominal pain, and their teeth itch, you know. <laughs> well, you know, those are the ones that I would say are difficult because they take a lot of time, but even more important to make sure that we at least have a consideration for each of those complaints. They're each evaluated, and we have a consideration for those potential left ending complaints with those patients. Right, right. Well, you know, when I, I was working ER, this is a few years ago. I haven't worked in Obamacare. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is really not, I guess it's kind of changing the subject a little bit. Um, we weren't afforded the luxury. I remember, you know, fighting with our administrators, you know, uh, especially if the patient did not have insurance. Uh, they were, you know, to be discharged, even in questionable circumstances. Um, has that changed at all with Obamacare where you're given leeway to admit someone to, for observation? Or is it the same as it was when I was working 15 years ago? You know, it hasn't really changed because of Obamacare. The only thing that's really done, I think, is given some patients the ability to get medical care and not to have a huge bill when they get home because of it. Okay. But as far as our ability to admit a patient or to observe a patient that we're concerned about, at least in my emergency department, we've always been able to do that. Okay. And there's some patients that come in, maybe it's like an elderly patient and I mean, this is a cynical way of looking at it, but the family goes to the nursing home. They haven't been there for six months. They find, surprisingly, that their 92-year-old grandmother with dementia has actually is actually looking worse now than they were six months ago when they visit him. So they send him straight to the ER, you know. And so we say, well, that patient doesn't really need to be admitted, but they can't really go back to maybe not nursing home, but independent living or whatever they happen to be in. Well, we do have some mechanisms now where we can try to get a patient admitted directly to a extended care facility or get other type of follow-up. But no, if we're concerned about a patient, we're still able to admit them, and Obamacare hasn't really changed that. Okay. I guess that's a subject for another show. Right. <laughs> exactly. Cynthia, any questions before we close? Um, let's see. I think that's pretty thorough. Okay. Very, no, you don't, you don't have to. You don't have to ask questions. That's okay. okay. Well, Mike, I'd like to thank you for coming out and spending the time and letting us know about your three bounce back books, which are all available on Amazon. Michael Weinstock on the bounce back, uh, put in bounce back under the uh, search term in Amazon. And uh, any plans for more books, Michael? Yep, we are actually are starting in January, so in 11 months, on bounce back's critical care. Oh, very and good. that's very exciting. It'll be just a departure from some of these other ones, but really, again, driving home some of those points of the critical care management of a patient in the emergency department. Yeah. Very good. We look forward to that. We'll have to have a hang on after that. Absolutely. So, okay, we'll end the broadcast and hang out there for a second. We'll chat. Thank you okay, very much. Okay, thank you so much for having thank me. You.